I would give uh, two lectures today. I think the first part will be about water demand, that is how much water we need, what we need it for. And the other one part is uh, water supply systems. And then we have a break, and after that I'll talk about drinking water treatment. So first we can uh, ask, why is it actually we want to improve the water supply? And what is uh, what is what kind of improvement do we have? Do you have any ideas why? What what are the reasons we have talked about last week? But what are the reasons we want to improve the water supply? Yeah. Improve health. Improve health. Yes. Yeah. To uh, improve the water from the crops. Yeah. To have water for our agriculture. Yeah. So yeah, and how do we get more time for work it by improving the water so by putting the water closer? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we talk about the putting water closer, what else should we do? What else could be the purpose of uh, improving water supply other than putting it closer to people? Cleaner. Cleaner. To have it more clean, yes. Clean maybe people won't uh, ruin their pipes. To to protect it from from being broken. Yeah. To improve the yeah, so it's not being broken yeah. the pipes, yeah. Mm -hmm. More water so there is enough for example for hygiene. That's yeah. right. Getting more water. So closer water, and that was with the purpose of uh, getting more time available for other things. Also to get more water in the household. We need more water for, for washing hands, for um, washing any, any hygiene, for bathing and, and so on. And then we need also cleaner water and that has some uh, health implications to make uh, clean water. And then it was also mentioned uh, more water for production. I don't need to show slides here because you know everything. That's great. Uh, if we look back at the F diagram, um, from uh, that uh, also has been shown when we talked about health and sanitation. You can see we have, uh, this is showing how especially diarrhea is spreading uh, from feces and to other people over there. Um, you can see it goes through different, uh, through the water, through the fields, through the flies, with the fingers and so on. And there are certain ways to break this as we have seen before, sanitation can break some. Water quality can uh, break some lines. Water quantity, hand washing can break uh, some lines here. Yeah. And um, as we see, the most, say, the first uh, barrier is the sanitation. First of all, to to keep the feces uh, away from um, away from from people, put it into a hole. Uh, and the second one, most important here, is the hand washing. Uh, because sanitation will, will stop, break many of the uh, roots here, but uh, not with the fingers, and this is where the, the hand washing uh, comes in. But with this, we also, um, we have some extra things we want to, uh, we need to, some extra barriers. One is the water quality, so even if we happen to uh, pollute the drinking water, we can, we can uh, clean it here by make some, uh, drinking water treatment or protection of the water uh, and if we want uh, hand washing uh, we also need water so it's these two this these lectures here will uh, deal with water quantity and the water quality and it's the second part here if we start looking at we're focusing on the domestic water supply we don't talk much about the irrigation uh, of fields and, and so on. We're focusing on the health uh, part of uh, this. So domestic water demand. What do we need water for? What is? What do we need most water for? Any idea? Yes? No, I'm talking about in domestic, in the house. In the household, we're using water for different things. What do we need it most for? For food and drinking? Other suggestions? Washing. Washing what? Like washing yourself, washing clothes. Bathing, washing clothes. Yeah. Washing dishes, yeah. And toilet. 
How much water do we need actually? How much does one person need in a day? Yes? In total? Five liters total? Yeah? What do you say? Uh, Others? Mm -hmm. In here we use uh, around 100 liters. In Denmark, around the 100 liters or a little bit more, I think. In, yes? That's right. So five liters, 100 liters. Why is. Why do we, yes? Five liters a day, not uh, one liter. No, no, it's per day. One, five liters per day or 100 liters. In Denmark, we use 100 liters per day, 140 and something like that. Five liters, what is that number? Uh, I think because uh, in Denmark, uh, in some countries, they have uh, not. Uh, yeah? They can't, uh, for example, uh, have uh, clean uh, water. It will irritate. I think if they have clean water, they will, will uh, use it. Uh, they won't use it in all years. They will use it only for England. They're saving a lot of water, yeah? Bangladesh, about 50 liters. Okay, that's another number. Yeah? But it depends on the humidity, the cold, the warm. Depends on the humid, the cold, and the warm. Maybe the Depends on the way they live. Depends on many things. Um, lots of numbers coming up here. Um, I'll show you here one investigation from two different places where they tried to look in detail what the uh, households use their water for. And they looked at drinking, they looked at cooking, washing food and utensils, bathing, ritual washing uh, like you do before you go to the mosque. Uh, washing clothes and and other things here. So they looked at uh, four different cases. Two of them, uh, the red and the, the blue one, uh, was from Mozambique, where people had to walk very long distances. I think in in, in the one, the red one in Tanda here, they had to walk almost 10 kilometers to get their water. And the two other places was in Sudan, where they were actually buying water from it, but it was a slum area, so they also limited. I mean. It's places where, where the water uh, consumption is quite limited compared to Denmark. So first of all, we see here, the, the, the highest is definitely bathing. If you're using very little water, then bathing would be the highest one. And it looks like washing clothes uh, also comes, um, also comes uh, higher than this one. And, and the fifth one, I forgot that, is uh, from uh, Bangladesh. Um, I don't remember exactly the, the setting there. But we can see things like bathing, washing clothes, uh, comes higher than drinking, uh, drinking and cooking. Yes. Would the sugar be high than the other province of Bangladesh? Do you have any idea what that would? I suppose it could be use of toilet, washing, flushing the toilet. I don't remember. I have to say that. But it could be flushing the toilet, because that is what is missing very much compared to Denmark, for example. Uh, we're pouring lots of water into the toilet every day. And that is a very big part of our consumption, even though we have uh, water-saving uh, toilets. So I think that's, that's what comes there. In Bangladesh, they, they, they prefer to wash themselves with water after, after the toilet. So, but we can see the total consumption here, very different. If we look at the very worst situation where they had to walk almost 10 kilometers, the total consumption is only 5 liters per day, which is not even covering what we used to say for cooking and, and, and drinking. The 5 liters that you mentioned there is, is a number that is usually said this is for cooking and drinking for, for everyone. But here they're really, really saving a lot of water because they have to walk so far. They're probably doing their bathing at the water pump. That may, that may not be counted. Uh, while in, uh, in Sudan here where they're buying their water, the consumption is more like 20, 25. And this is a very common figure. If you have to carry the water home, if it's not too far away, you would often see that the consumption ends up in, in 20, 25 liters per 
per day here. There's some general uh, guidelines on uh, demand here. First, first, I mean, when you install, when you make a water project, what what is it? What are the um, what are the guidelines for for installing water supply here? First of all, you say people should walk maximum 500 meters to get their water. Otherwise, you start spending so many so much time. So getting it within 500 meters. Uh, when you establish a water point, that could be a hand pump or a, a tap. It should be at least one per 250 people. Otherwise, the lines of people will be uh, very high. And then the consumption. This is uh, a bit disputed, you could say, but but typically, if people have to carry it home, I would say they you seldom see that they use more than 25 liters per capita per day. If you think of it, 25 liters per capita. If you're a household with uh, 20 with five people. 25 liters would be 125 liters per day that maybe the woman the 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 um, the woman in the family maybe with the help of a child or something has to carry home 125 liters how many buckets is that that is a bucket of 15 so it would be seven maybe eight eight buckets per day so if you have to walk every time 10 minutes eight times is quite quite a lot of work, and that is uh, even just to get 25 liters per person in the household. Then you say drinking and cooking, typically five liters uh, per person per day. This is a very general number, uh, but we have made some investigations in, in India and West Bengal where it turns out that they are actually using more than five liters. I don't know if it has to do with the way they're cooking or, or what, but they're using more like 10 liters per person here. And if you look at some general uh, experiences here, water carried in buckets home between 5 and 40 liters per capita per day. If you have a yard connection, that means you have one tap. This is many places. The first, the next step, when you start having water installed in houses, you put a tap in the yard, but not a lot of taps inside the house. Then you would be using 20 to 80 liters per capita. And if you have multiple taps, if you have a showers, if you have kitchen water, if you have uh, toilet water and all that, then you come up to 70 to 250. In Denmark, we have done a lot to reduce the water uh, supply by different technical means and by campaigns and so on. So we're down to 100. But if you look at other countries in Eastern Europe where there's, the systems are, are, are maybe broken and so on, you very often find 200, 250 people are using a lot for car washing and so on. Good. So that was uh, about the water. It depends very much on the setting, how your water supply is, the, the demand. So where can we get the water? If we look at the uh, situation here, where we have a family living here in a house, Where would they be able to, what kind of water could we find here? What water sources do they have? Yes? Groundwater. Groundwater? Uh, rainwater. We could have some groundwater here. We could have some rainwater. Yeah. What else? Surface water, rivers, ponds, lakes. That could be a uh, river. Running here, that could be a lake over here. Yeah. What else? Yeah. Is it cold? Snow. Snow. Ice. Maybe there's some melting ice in the mountains. There would be snow. Kilimanjaro is this uh, mountain here. Um, yes. What else? We miss one source. Yeah. The rivers? Oh, the rivers here. Yeah. Spring. Spring. Yes. Spring is uh, is like groundwater in the in the mountains where it where it comes out here at the spring. The water. Um, and when we say groundwater, we can we can talk about different uh, layers of uh, groundwater here. So there would be uh, different ways to pick up this water. Um, what could be this 
some quick um, water supply systems. Yeah? Can you make a tap well? You can make a tap well. Yeah, no, I don't want to. We'd be looking at top wells. We would be looking at the surface water here, the the top, sorry, the top aquifer here, where um, when the water is not under pressure. Yeah. What else? The, what did you say, Mom? Uh, the boreholes. Boreholes, yeah. That could be. We want to go for the deep uh, water here, so we. Drill a borehole. A borehole is very smaller, like 10 centimeters, 15 max. Uh, while a dog well is about one meter here. But that could be going to the deep water. Deep, uh, and the, this uh, deep aquifers could be under pressure. So as soon as you, you bore into this, you will see that the water is rising by itself uh, to, some, to some level here. Because the, the, the water is, is coming from from the mountain, so that somehow it's, it's been falling on a place where it was a higher ground. So the difference in um, compression means that it can it can go up to to some level here by itself. Yeah. Other water supply systems, then? Yeah, yeah, you're so good. Keep yeah, going. but I mean, it's okay. It's okay. Housing rainwater. Housing rainwater. Yeah. On the roof, maybe? Yeah. Collect it and uh, put it into a container here. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yes? Bucket. Bucket to get from the river. From the river. So you take this into a bucket. Or from the river, yeah. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. I don't know if you the tank one. Yeah? For what water? What tank? Uh, rainwater. For collecting the rainwater? Yeah? You would have to collect it on, on something, on some large area, like the roof, for example. So you put it in a, in a tank here. Yeah? Oh. Mm -hmm. Then it hides from the spring. Yeah. And then you can put the spring here into some pipes that you can leak. To attack. All right, these are the water supply systems that we're going to look at <coughs> in this lecture. I think more or less what we got. So let's take a look at it here. This is the first one, the rainwater harvesting. Uh, There's an example here from uh, India where they have a quite a a well-built uh, house where they're collecting water from the roof and it's running down into this big jar here of about one cubic meter. It's made of uh, cement. They're using the same jars here in Cambodia. Uh, the houses are much more simple. They are raised on stilts probably uh, because of uh, floods. And um, here they are also collecting the water from the roof. Uh, in one gutter, you can see they're moving. It's very simple. They're they're filling one one jar here, and then they're moving to the onto the next one here. You can also so that was some private ones. You can also have it institutional. Here is a it's a school, I think, or another institution where where the tank is much bigger and uh, very um, well built and uh, expensive to build. And you can also have it. In plastic from a school in Ghana and um, so these, these are some different usually you, you you collect the water from the roof you could have set up something uh, else but um, but usually you use the roof that is uh, already present here so what are the advantages can you tell me what what's the advantages with the rainwater uh, Clean? Fresh, fresh water. It's um, drinkable. Yes. So the quality is good quality? Yeah. Drinking water, yeah. What else? Other good things? Yeah? It doesn't hurt the house. No, it's close to the house. I mean, when we're using the roof, it means we're collecting it by the house. Yeah? Yes? 
it's free. It doesn't cost anything. It's not exactly true because this one costs yeah. uh, something. So it's not necessarily a cheap um, cheap thing because every household has to buy something I'm like that. Thinking free. of the most consumed. Yeah, the water mm -hmm. itself is is free. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any disadvantages? Yes. There's no minerals. No, no minerals in the water. So I think it's difficult to actually soak the water. Yes, it can be difficult to, to remove the soap from the hands afterwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm, yes. No, it is only it only comes when it rains. So. Uh, so what do you do about that? You put it in a big tank. That means you can save it more than the time that it rains. But is that a lot of time? Or what? But you also need to clean the the jar. You need to keep the jar clean. Mm -hmm. And you need to clean the roof. Clean because uh, I use myself in my house at home uh, to collect water for the garden. But if I don't clean the roof, I saw that it becomes it takes a lot of um, organic things from the trees and things, and then it comes down and starts uh, com decomposing and it smells very bad. So that's also something. But you can, if you keep it clean, you can get a quite a nice water quality. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you're not uh, storing it correctly, like the other jars you show. Uh, some might some pollute in them or leaves and other. Yeah, you may, you may, it may be polluted if you don't, uh, if you're not careful. There are some system to remove the first flush, or what they call, but if you have dust on your roof after the dry season, so you don't take the first part of it and so on. I want to show you some something out here. Um, there's some extra slides. I'm showing you lots of pictures today, but if you look in the slides that I'm uploading here, you find some uh, extra slides to tell about how to how to calculate how much water you can get from this. It's not very. I think it's it's too uh, it takes too long time to go through and it's pretty boring. But if you need to to make calculations and so on, there's a lot of slides in between that you can uh, that you can look in. You can look at afterwards. And um, what this one actually says is that the um, um, the amount of water that you get that you can get depends on the size of the roof. I mean, there are two parameters here. There's the size of the roof, and there's the size of the container. And the size of the roof depends on how much water you can collect. And the size of the container contain de decides how long time you can you can save the water. So if you collect a, from a big roof, you can collect a lot of water. But if you only have a small container, it would be run full, and you would lose a lot of that water. So the the, the idea is to to find a good balance between the right size of the roof, which you may not determine, you may not decide because it depends on the size of the houses. But um, and then the, the size of the container. But in re, in the very short conclusion, um, I would say that the house, uh, rainwater harvesting is only for the rainy season and a little bit more. It's it's talking about days. You you don't keep water. If you look at the size of this one, it's about let's say one cubic meter. And if you have a water consumption of 125 liters that we talked about before for a family, five people, 125 liters per person per day, no, per family per day, it's only water enough for, for what, seven days, seven, eight days. Um, so it's not, um, uh, it's, it's not for storing during the dry season. It, uh, yeah. It is, it is for the rainy season, an addition in the rainy season. Good. Moving on to rivers, they can look like this. 
with a bit of growth of uh, water hyacinth, I think. Can be a big problem somewhere. Sometimes the river runs dry, and um, uh, in the dry season, uh, depends on the size and uh, the conditions here. And some, and then you can often find the some extra water by digging into the into the river ground because the water would be running uh, under the river also. So uh, often you can extend the the water supply, but. Um, Another surface water source here is uh, the pond. Um, this is an example from the northern Ghana. And um, you can see people are, are, are living here in a very remote area. And uh, the only water source they have is, is uh, this one that they, where they fetch the water uh, uh, inside, from inside the water. This is a bit similar thing. This is from West Bengal. And um, here they have, they have constructed the ponds. The, the other one was very natural, you can say. This is kind of constructed. They had a wetland and they were digging in and constructing some ponds and some other land that they can walk on. So you can see here they're using it for bathing. They're using it for washing utensils. Uh, they may be keeping fish in it. Here they are uh, trying to clean it with some uh, lime that would uh, uh, sediment all the particles and, and so on. So, if you should say, what is the advantages of uh, surface water, rivers and... Um, it's easy to, um, to get because it's always there, if there's a yeah. river or a pond, but... Um, easy to pick it up? Yeah, but it may be contaminated. Yeah. So, that's not a good thing, so I, yeah, I wouldn't prefer it. No? No. But it... I wouldn't either. Yeah. That's right. So... Then there are other things to say about this. It's easy to pick it up, so it's very much used. If you look at where is the big cities around the world placed, they're always at the near river, very often near river, because that's where you easily could get the water a long time ago, at least. In Denmark, we have a lot of uh, groundwater uh, supply, but this is quite specific for Denmark, that every it's 97% of our... Uh, consumption, which is based on groundwater, but in other countries they are very much using surface water, so it's possible to use, but it's uh, usually uh, dirty, and you have to you have to treat it in order to use it, in, at least for drinking and cooking. But but using it for bathing, using it for washing utensils, it's quite okay. Here's another one that looks a little bit um, like this. This is also from Ghana, from the northern part of Ghana where they have um, protected, they have uh, built a dam, actually. All this uh, uh, soil here is, is, is a dam that they have built. They have a very short rainy season in the, in the northern part of Ghana, and um, they have to keep the water. And one way to store a lot of water is to build a, a dam. And you can see uh, it's very nicely built with a, with a, a run, uh, what is this, a spillway here where the water can run out when it's too much, when it's raining too much and it's overflowing here, they have a, made a spillway so it doesn't destroy the, the sides of it here. Um, they have made even a very clever thing, I haven't seen it other places in the world here. Outside in the middle of the dam, they are collecting water. There's, a, there's just a pipe that's going down under the water, under the soil, and then it's ending up over here into something that looks like an, uh, uh, a dove well, but it, it, is, it is a well. It, it's built like a well, but it's connected to this water. So that means, and you can see they have barbed wire here around the, around the dam, so it means nobody is going into the dam. So they're preventing people from getting into the water, and that means that the water quality that they can get here is, is quite good. We, we, we did some, uh, as a student, a DCU student, so, um, back in 99, who, who did some measurements on this, and it was quite clean. I mean, it's surface water that we said before is, is dirty, but it's only dirty if, if it's polluted, if there's people going into it and using it, people living upstream to the river. Otherwise, it can be quite uh, quite good quality, and it is in this case. It's not such a cheap solution. It, it costs a lot to build these big constructions, but simple. 
time. Yeah, um, it doesn't. You can see it in uh, West Bengal where they have the ponds, uh, a lot of ponds, um, and you can see it here. It it stays all over the dry season. Uh, so there may be some evaporation, but uh, but uh, it still is a way to keep a lot of water. I have not tried to make a balance of that, but uh, but it look. I mean, we can see that it's possible if you have a big water source. You know, you can keep it for a long time, over many 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 months. In this case, uh, in in northern Ghana, where they also had other surface water sources like the. Um, Dock wells uh, here, they were they would be running dry. That layer of water would be running dry, but the uh, but the big dam would be the one that was staying all through the dry season. And here is right a picture from the same place again, northern Ghana. Here it's a simple dock well, just a hole in the ground, and um, we see from the top it's a little bit uh, different from many other places here, but but. Basically, it's just a, um, a hole in the ground. What would be the advantage of uh, such a, a well? Mm. No fluor, fluor inside. No, what? No, uh, what? Fluoride. Fluoride. Yeah. yeah? It's not contaminated uh, typically with, with minerals, no, like chloride. Well, it could be arsenic, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was it quite clean compared to surface water, for example? Yeah, cleaner, cleaner than sur surface water. And it is cheap and easy to construct? Very easy to construct, yeah. yeah. You can, in principle, build it outside your house. Yeah. So it's cleaner than surface water, but if you want to make it really clean, you have somehow to protect it. And this is what we call protected well, protected dug well. Um, yeah, maybe you can explain to me, how is this dug well protected? Well, it's uh, the whole seal at the top. Yeah, and like the lid here. Yeah, and mm -hmm. also uh, the construction around the dug well, so yeah. no surface water can reach the ground water. Uh, this, this, the apron, it's called. A yeah. uh, big slab prevents that water would be flowing down uh, along the the dock well and into the water. Yeah. yeah and, uh, yeah. Yeah. And also because it has a lining here inside the pit, about. Uh, three meters would be the standard to to line with with cement, so no but no water is flowing into the well. The first three meters, you need of course in the bottom to water to flow in, uh, but um, but at least the first three meters, then the water would be seeping down, would be clean somehow, be be filtered. It has the raised uh, uh, apron here that prevents uh, surface water from running into it. A bit unusual, it has a, a lid also, but that's just an extra feature here. Could you put a hand pump on it also? Or? You're suggesting a hand pump? Fantastic, I just okay. had that picture right here. So uh, that, that is an extra way to, uh, to protect the water. You can put uh, something on top, for example, a hand pump, a very uh, simple and cheap one in, in this case, and that would be closing the last one, because the the pollution of the, the groundwater, the dock well here, comes actually from the buckets here. When you, if you put the bucket on the on the ground where somebody has been shitting or home, if, if you have a, any any pollution, you would take it into the water. It may not be a very big uh, source of uh, pollution, but but it is some some source of pollution. The last pollution you can you can shut by by putting something on top here. Like a hand pump, yeah. Is that water, uh, drinking the water quality? Is this is very, this is very good for the drinking water quality. If you protect it like this, um, there would be no problem with the drinking water quality. And it's often the most appropriate water source 
if if you have very poor uh, conditions, poor people, this would be often the preferred solution if you have uh, groundwater uh, in the top. I mean, the top groundwater I'm trying to give. That would be the most sustainable because it's also easy to maintain. There's no um, no no parts and so on. Yeah. Then we still have the problem that it might dry out in the dry season. Yes, it okay. could dry out out in the end of the dry season. Yeah. Uh, that uh, that depends very much on the hydrogeology geology on the on the spot. Uh -huh. yeah. So so the way you 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 dig it during the dry season. At the end of the dry season, you dig the hole so you can get. As, as low as you can. I mean, it could be you have bedrock, so you have to stop somewhere. But at least you're digging down to the water and two meters more uh, into the water. That would be the standard of uh, making a, a dock well here. Another thing you can put on top. This is a very, very clever thing that was invented in Nicaragua um, some 30, 40 years ago. <clears throat> it's called the rope and washer pump. And you can see this nice little animation here showing how it, how it works. There's a pipe uh, going up here, and there's a, we have this uh, mill here where, with a, which has a handle that you turn around. And then there's a rope with some small uh, rubber things on it uh, here and there. And then when the rubber things goes off, they sort of drive the water up to here, and then the water runs out. And it's very, very easy if you try these pumps. It's, it, it feels very, very easy to, to get the water up this way, much more than with a, with a hand pump uh, handle here. And it's very simple because there's, there's no, I mean, if the rope is broken, breaking, you, you, just, uh, you just tie it up again or get a new rope. So it's a very, very simple one. In this uh, example here, it's, it's, it's from uh, Cambodia where it has been exported. This is a very good example of uh, sharing technology between uh, the South countries here. Here it is from the original site from Nicaragua. Um, one uh, typical example here on the ground where he, he is getting water. He has totally protected his well here and he gets the water in his bucket. And here another one has, has even raised it up to this level here. So he can walk up all the stairs and, and, and drive the water all the way up so he has the water inside here. And when you have it in a tank, then you can distribute it to your house or to your garden. And, and uh, so this is a very uh, advanced, you could say, way with very simple technology to, to have water under pressure here. So I think I already mentioned the advantages. Uh, yeah. I don't know what the disadvantage is, all other <laughs> because I mean it costs some money compared to something that costs no money, but uh, it's still quite a cheap uh, solution, and it is very, very durable. So why do they then mostly maintain pumps in the rain water? It's a good, good point. Uh, hand pump is the old. Way we have it, we had it in Denmark in 1850s, but I don't know. Uh, it has not been, it's not so known, but it's being spread. I mean, that I saw it, and you were also in Cambodia and saw it probably. It, it's something that that is spreading these years to Africa also some places, but it's not very well known in Africa. But it it is, I think it's a question of being known. I mean, it's yeah, what's the depth limit on this kind of thing? Uh, they they can pump I pretty deep. Ten fifteen meters is possible. Of course it takes more power to 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 do it, but as far as I remember it, and they have different uh, sizes, it depends on the size of the pipe and so on. Uh, they, is they, the outflow comparable to a hand pump? I think it is, yes. Yes. <coughs> My experience. I have seen it pumping from Quite some depth, like 10 meters, and then still it felt quite easy to, to do. And what about is there is another reason to not put in the water? Like in a in a well, you would you would put the 
the person the one of the soul entering the well would never go anywhere? I mean, the well is just a normal uh, dog well, protected dog well, <coughs> where the water is running in in the bottom from the from the water layer that is there. So um, there shouldn't be be any uh, any issues there. The normal pump has to be a closed system, or at least it has the rope going into the air. As you see, there is a small opening here, and uh, a small opening here where it comes out. This is where it goes in, uh, and this is where it comes out. Uh, so, in principle, there, there would be some ways of, uh, of polluting. But they are so small, it, it, in, in reality, I don't think it's, it is an issue. So they still be able to take the water. They still around But you s well, then you would have to cover the whole thing and only have the handle out, is that what I mean? Yeah, yeah, you could, uh, I haven't seen that, but in principle you could have just the handle sticking out, yeah. But I, I, I think, I mean, we're still talking about developing countries, very low, um, uh, very poor living conditions and so on. Um, little bit of dirt, even we can also survive, even though we are weak. Pardon? Uh, this, I mean, this looks like a, a, a wheel from a, not a car, I don't know. I think this is made specially for the purpose here. Um, but it could be made from a car. I mean, if you start from, from scratch, I don't know with this one here. It looks like something from a motorcycle or something like that. Yeah, it could be the same as from a motorcycle. Good. Going on to the spring. Here. We have a spring in the mountain. Water is uh, raining in the high, on the higher ground here. And uh, then the water is running into the aquifer here and suddenly emerging down here, and this is where we have the spring. As you can see, because of the water pressure, there may be some places where it comes out also as uh, springs, and they have a little bit different name depending on what it looks like. But that's the principle. Water is falling in the higher ground, and suddenly lower down, it's, it is emerging like a spring. What is the, what is the advantage of springs? Um, it's quite clean and fresh. Through yes, um, you get filtrated through yeah. through the ground, so it's usually quite clear and Maybe clean. Maybe there are also some minerals and minerals. Some what? Some minerals. There could be some minerals that taken up by the from the from the ground here, yeah. And then there are different kinds of minerals that the water can capture, but they just at one time take the control. Yeah, let's say it looks like most of it is coming out here. And you don't need a no? Especially if you live, uh, you know, <coughs> lower. If you're living lower, then you can, uh, you don't need a pump. You just put the pipe there, more or less, and then you get it directly to your house. Mm -hmm. So clean water, and you can have water under pressure, so you can distribute it to several houses, several villages maybe, if there's enough water. That is a very big advantage. What is the disadvantage? Yeah. So you can control it if you don't have a spring too bad. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not always you have a spring. You need to live near to a mountain, yeah? <coughs> yeah? And that's where the water can contaminate It can be, that's what we say with some minerals like fluoride or... So I mean after the spring. Yeah, after the spring. When it comes out, it, comes, it becomes a river and uh, it can be contaminated at that place, or just where it runs out. Therefore, you used to make some kind of construction here, uh, where, which is called a spring box. Here comes the water, and usually it was running out here, soon quickly getting uh, dirty by the, by the soil here. So, so you dig a hole, and you build a small construction where the water is running in, so you keep it clean before it gets contaminated 
and get it into uh, into the pipe, and so you can <coughs> lead it to the village. And that's how you keep it keep it clean, uh, avoid contamination of it. Disadvantages? Yeah. Uh, probably if the spring is quite far away from the village, it's costly and the yeah. effort to get the water that the pipes. All the pipes pipes are, are expensive, quite expensive, and uh, you don't usually live or you don't always live very close to the spring. So uh, um, a spring is and with pipes and so on, uh, it's something that is very often preferred by projects. If there's a project from the World Bank, Danida, which has money for investments, then they would um, often install this. Because uh, one advantage has not been mentioned yet, but it's the, the it, it doesn't need much maintenance. A pipe is not moving parts, something, nothing is breaking. It's not all true, but maybe you have some. Yeah, it was just like you pass the pipe to the, you can burn the ground because if there are mm. just the top there and animals can. Yeah, it is. It is, uh, it's best to dig pipes down. That is the standard. You dig it down to some, some depth. Um, because otherwise some animals may destroy it, or even humans. Uh, remember in, in Tanzania where it stayed the, the people who were maintaining the, the water supply systems, they were often driving out because elephants, elephants were destroying them. They could hear the water running in the pipes and they had learned that if they uh, do like this, then it will break and they can get some water very easily. So they often went out and uh, repaired them. That was from the elephant. Sometimes in, in mountains, there's rocky areas, so you cannot really get it into the ground. It can be difficult. So, But the standard is to dig it down if possible. And then you can uh, take it into pipes, and you can set up a gravity scheme like here in Nepal, where you put up water posts so people can come and just open the tap. I mean, this is much easier than all the systems we have seen before. Now we just have to open a tap, uh, um, seen from the point of the uses. Uh, in this case, is in uh, South Africa, in a slum area, actually. It, uh, it's a stand post where, where this guy, he's taking money from people. So people are buying uh, their, their, um, their water. And uh, when he's not working, he's closing it by putting this big, drum on top and putting a, a padlock on it, and um, that's the way to control that. Here's another example of uh, hand uh, standpipes um, from Ghana, um, where the standpipe was by the road near to a school, and the school children would every day go and fill uh, this bucket so they could wash their hands and have drinking water. Um, And they also, you can see, they put padlocks on here. So it's possible, it's not very often you see that, but it's uh, possible to close, to have taps which you can close. And it, it's all to, I mean, make sure that the, the system is sustainable in the sense that you need, you collect some money so you can maintain the system. It costs something to maintain. Good. Moving on to the D2 well here. The Installation of a water to get uh, of a tube well to get uh, to the deep aquifer here. Uh, you need a big machine, a big drilling rig um, to to dig, and there are some different ways you can dig it. But um, you can see here they're saying a bit, little prayer before uh, starting the machine, and then they started and. Soil is coming up, and then they are drilling uh, by rotating this uh, uh, drilling thing for for some time. And uh, this is from northern Ghana. Um, again, you see these are the people that we saw before using the very dirty water in the in the small uh, natural pond here. Uh, they are quite interested in getting water, so uh, everybody turns up and see what's going on here. So they do a drilling for a day. In this case. Uh, they didn't find water, unfortunately, and they had even they had picked out uh, 12 spots where they thought within a, a county or something like that. They had picked out 12 spots that they thought were were possible, and they found only water in six of them. 
it's a bit, um, I mean, this is the, no, let me ask you, what is the advantage of the deep tube well, you know that? Yeah, I mean, you can often find a lot of water down there, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's clean. It's also clean water. Again, the water has come all the way here, filtered through here, so, so often you it's pretty clean. Clean from a microbiological point of view, at least. Yeah? Yes? No, I mean, it can. Again, it can. Depending on the system, if you're pumping too much, it, it may dry out. So, but it's often a, a, a source that is uh, abundant in, in water, so you can have it all through the dry season also. So the disadvantage, what is the disadvantage of deep tube wall water here? You need uh, to distribute it. You, you need a, a, an extra system. You know, you need to pump it into a water tower somehow, and, and then you can distribute it. So it, in itself, no, it's true. It doesn't give you water under pressure, no. Yeah. It's uh, really expensive, especially with the steam water. You spend a lot of money drilling. Yes. Drilling is quite expensive. With such a drilling rig, uh, depending on where you are in the world, but it can easily be about ten thousand dollars for drilling. That that is a very common price in Africa, where the drilling rigs are, are few and uh, water is uh, difficult to find. Often ten thousand dollars for a drilling rig for 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 one uh, hole. And if you put a hand pump on, you remember from earlier. How many people have you served? 250 people for $10,000. It's, it's, it's not much. So it's quite expensive, yeah? Other disadvantages? Yeah? You may use dry and you can find it in the pond inside of the Yeah. You, you, it, it's, it's not like the river. You can see there's water. Here you don't know. Like in the example I was mentioning here in, in Ghana. They didn't find water, even though they have used some geophysics uh, measurements trying to estimate it. You, you don't know because you can't see it. Um, but there is also some water sometimes which is in between. Somehow, this is not the top water, this is not the the one way you can dig a well here, but you can make it drilling down to about 25, 20 meters. Uh, this is the case of the West Bengal, where you, in some places, have a lot of water available. Here, three people with a small bamboo uh, arrangement here, and um, some uh, pipes, uh, some um, iron pipes here, um, can find, can establish a borehole and put a hand pump on hand pump here in, in one day and uh, the, the material is um, long a long uh, plastic flexible plastic uh, pipe here that they uh, that they bring and in the bottom they have made again from some bamboo things and a bit of uh, uh, what do you call it iron uh, mesh they just build it on the side uh, the lower few meters is where the water can get in. Then you put some uh, like mosquito net around it, so it uh, keeps the sand out, most of it, and then um, this is where it's sucking the water in. And then you put the hand pump on top. On top. This is very expensive, this is very cheap. They, they can establish such a, a hole for about $50, including the cheap hand pump. So, uh, so it's something that a lot of uh, private people also establish in, in that place. But it, this is where you're lucky, where you have water that is reasonably uh, shallow, what we call shallow uh, water here, not deep uh, water. Um, so they're lucky in that place here. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Imagine this is a, this is a pipe of uh, five, ten centimeters. 
So I'm standing here, I'm standing up here. He's the guy with the hand. So um, the other ones are, 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 are taking it up and down. They can, they can move it with that uh, stick here. They can move it up and down. So when it's down, I put my hands on it and then they take it up. So I'm sucking kind of the soil. Then I lift my hand, they take it out again, so the soil is coming out. Then I put my hand on again, I'm sucking it up, I remove my hand, and they take it down while it's running out. That way you're taking gradually a little bit of soil all the way. So you need the tubes down there? No, in the end, you, you, you put more and more tubes, I mean they have tubes of uh, 3 meters length or something like that. So they put one, when it comes down 3 meters, you put a new tube on top and then you put that down. In the end, you take the whole thing out again, and it will be stable enough. And then that, then you put the plastic pipe, the plastic tube down instead. I mean, it, it's stable enough for that time it takes to put the plastic down. Very simple. And then you can put a hand pump on. Here is a private hand pump in a rich, little bit richer family. This is their toilet, nicely. Constructed, they have their own hand pump, but the hand pump can also be public. This is in a village. All these are from West Bengal, uh, in a village where people are lining up. This is from Indonesia, in the outskirts of a city where people are using it for washing their feet. And this one, what is this? Ah, uh, this is not for water. It's a gas station. So this is how it is, a lot of places in developing, right? like here, you know, you, you take it out, you press, gas is coming out. But when there's no power, there's no gas, then you start doing like this, in Tanzania, or, I mean, he's, he's using a handle right there. When you don't have power, you pump gas that way here. I'm just finishing, I think, in five minutes here, I know we have talked a long time here, but... Um, Raised hand pump here. This is an example where, where you raise it, and it can be either because of uh, floods, so you want to raise it so it's available when you have floods uh, in the area, or it's also a good idea if you, because it's easier to lift it. And I'm not, it sounds like I'm trying to promote uh, children um, carrying water, I'm actually not, but at least. When they're doing it, it's uh, possible for them to lift it to the, to the head. It's pretty tough, I mean, 20 liters. Those women here, they're stronger than me. And they, 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 they know, you know how to lift the 20 liter buckets to their heads. I, I think it's very, it's very heavy. And, um, but it's possible when you have a, a raised uh, platform here. And here's another one, the India Mark II. Pump is very um, common also in Africa. It's a very uh, strong pump for pumping down to a hundred or, or more meters. The last few ones is a little more, um, a little bit more sophisticated. These are solar panels. They're producing power, so they can pump uh, water. Um, maybe you. Could tell me what is the advantage of a solar pump and a pumping system here? The sun is always there, is it? This morning it was raining, huh? Still a little bit of sun. Mm -hmm. Yeah? At least in Africa it's always shining. Sun is always shining, isn't it? <coughs> Most. A lot, yeah? So you can get easy a lot of power, that was your point, yeah? Mm -hmm. And what's good about this, what's particularly <coughs> good about this power source? You can store it. You can store it, yeah? It's, it's, it's beginning. I think, I mean, battery, development of batteries is something that is really ongoing. You may know more about it than me, but until now it's not something that is uh, used very much. I think it's still quite expensive, but it's being, I think there's a lot of development. But it could be used to pump the water into your water tank, and then you could store the energy as gravitational energy. So you that's have right. The water 
That's right. And it's a very clean source, and you don't need you don't need a supply of huh? gas or no. Nuclear, really. No, it's a free green energy. Um, nobody needs to move their hands, um, and you can pump it. So that that that's a good point. I mean, the way to to save the energy or is to pump it to the high place already from the beginning. Yeah. So that's good solar. Here's a wind pump. Wind pumps also be used. When this uh, windmill is going round, uh, a rod is going up and down and pumping the water. What's good about wind? Same thing, isn't it? When it's windy, you get water. So it's nice. But it has some problems. And uh, in this case, it was in uh, Tanzania, 1989, no, 1990. Actually, the transmission rod, there, was, there should be a long uh, iron rod here, uh, but it was actually broken. So it was there, it looked nice, but it was not working. I mean, it was not used for anything because it was broken. So instead, they had put a diesel engine here <laughs> as a replacement. So that, then the, it was pumping into this tank. Unfortunately, unfortunately, that diesel engine was broken. And it's, as you see, it's far out in Maasai area. And uh, they were not able to repair it. So when I was there together with Torbjörn, actually, uh, we went with an old uh, machinist from Denmark that uh, had taken the job. He, he heard about the problem, so he, we went there with some tools, and he managed actually to, to repair it. So lucky them that day and for some time. But um, it's not that sustainable, yeah? Yeah, but uh, it adds another point of failure to like the system when you I mean wouldn't competitive wise be better to spend that money on another well. I mean what in what situation would you actually need uh, not to pump the water yourself? Hmm. You mean you could just as well have put a hand pump here? Uh, and you're making more things that you break. Yeah. And that is I mean, I think that's a point for both when it comes to the the uh, solar pump. Solar pump is not just the solar panels. It's also an electrical pump that, that needs to be working. And it can get broken. The wind pump can get broken. The diesel pump can get broken. It, it's, it's something vulnerable that is uh, difficult to maintain in many places. So it's, um, it's usually quite... Not, not the preferred solutions when you come out to uh, small villages far away from, from places where you can, can repair those things. And it's ex expensive, all of it. Also, the, we didn't say that about the solar panels. They're quite, still quite expensive, the solar panels. Yeah? Isn't there a general problem with the hand pump and wind pump? They don't have the knowledge to uh, repair them if they break down? The hand pumps? Yeah, or no. just like more advanced technology? I mean, yes, it is true. All, all of them have the issue that, that if it breaks, it, you have to repair. I mean, some things are, are so easy. For example, the dog well, the, uh, with the broken washer pump, carrying home with its pocket and so on, doesn't need much repair. But some things need repair. The hand pumps, I mean, that's something that they have work companies and, and development organizations work a lot on the um, hand pumps to develop hand pumps that are usually working for long times and easy to repair and they set up systems where where there's a place in the country that they can repair and they have you know, small repairs and big repairs so they educate some people in the village to maintain the hand pumps so they would do some things to clean and put oil on things every three months whenever it's needed and then they can also do some simple repairs up the top of what is what is on top of the above the ground. But then, if there's something down there uh, broken, then they might need some people from the capital to come and, and repair it. But hand pumps are usually quite durable. But you see a lot of broken hand pumps around the world, definitely. Uh, but it is um, it's possible. Uh, it's more complicated with the with the diesel pumps, but on the other hand, <laughs> you could find a lot of places where it's quite difficult to repair a hand pump. But the guy who has a car, he knows he knows how to repair that. I mean, it's it's 
it's also about interest and uh, about um, how how much people feel for for it. Some people can repair a car but not a hand pump, and that's a bit strange. It's not the ability sometimes. It's also who is responsible, who is. Uh, I mean, no, nobody wants to make a lot of work for all the other people and, and all that. Complicated issue. Give it. I'll. I will. Um, this is my second to last slide here. When you select a water supply system, how are you going to look at which water supply system you are? going to put in your village here. There, I have to say there is no straightforward methodology. You have to look at the <coughs> possible sources. Look at the sources you have available. Think of what is the easy um, thing, what is the relevant thing. Try to identify the relevant technologies that is working with these sources. You've seen a lot of examples on how to put uh, I mean, you put a hand pump on, on a, these people don't put a hand pump on a lake. Uh, so there's some combinations uh, of things that are common in the examples you saw here. And then, in the end, you have to let the user select the technology. A water supply system is most often a common thing, common good for a group of people. Let's say 250 people for a, for a hand pump. Um, so you let them decide in uh, what if there are more choices. So the idea is to, to try to uh, look at what is possible and then have a, a participatory process with the people on, on what to, what to um, choose. In this course, you, you have to make the choice yourself. You cannot talk to the villagers, so, so you will prioritize. We'll get back to what you're going to do exactly in the end. Okay, one more point. You can also make fuel supply. If you have a very good water source, very good quality, but it's a bit far away, you can say, okay, let's, people use, people can use this for drinking, cooking, and then you have another water source, which is nearby, but a bit dirty, and you don't care too much, or you don't want to treat it. In this case, it's, it's uh, from a, a place in Tanzania, near the, uh, um, what is the big lake? Lake Victoria, uh, Paul, um, they have three different water sources. So, so the investigation here showed that they had a, one with very little water. They used that only for drinking. They had another water source that was a bit uh, easier, accessible. They used for cooking and washing. And then they had maybe the lake and uh, or the river or whatever it was that they used for washing hands, for bathing, for washing clothes, and so on. It is possible. People can manage. They know. They know what is the good water, what is the bad water. Um, they may need education if it's a new water source you are establishing. You have to build that knowledge. But but people have their ways here. The WHO and the uh, United Nations, as as part of the Millennium Development Goals, define what is an acceptable. Uh, improved, what they call improved drinking water source, and what is an uh, unimproved drinking water source. And, and of course, the goal is that every drinking water should be improved. So if we start from the from the bottom, <coughs> the unimproved drinking water is an unprotected dug well, uh, the one which is not having a lining, unprotected spring where the water is just running out without having the spring box, cart with a small tank or drum uh, that is often you see someone selling water from a, from a, from a small truck with a, with a horse in front or something. Tanker truck, uh, this is something that is all not very commonly in developing countries as such, but if there's an emergency situation, a tanker would drive out and sell water. It's also not improved. And then all kinds of uh, surface water like rivers, dams, lakes, ponds, stream, canal, irrigation channel. As I said, some of them might improve to be good enough, but, but mostly surface water is not good because of the quality. And then bottled water is also not considered uh, unimproved. I think not because bottled water is unclean, just because it costs money, so, so people would not use it. So these are the unimproved water sources. The good ones, the improved water sources, is the pipe water, 
into a dwelling the taps to the yard or to the plot, public tap or standpipe, tube well, borehole or protected dock well, protected spring and rainwater collection. So these are considered uh, good and bad. Yes. Is the protected the sign that you showed us that it has the yeah, the that's hole. what I mean. You you can find yeah, okay. uh, you can find situations where where I would say like a dam, a protected dam would be good enough. Same times I would also say rainwater collection is good in itself, but it's not as, if it doesn't cover the whole year. It is not. I mean the situation is not good enough. So there are some um, uh, some some uh, ex exceptions you could you might say. However, if you treat water, then you could maybe use some of these water sources as well. So an unimproved drinking water source becomes a, an improved drinking water source. And that's what I'm going to talk about now, the different ways that you can uh, treat uh, water. If we look at the water quality problems, to improve the water quality, we have some water quality problems that are health related. Uh, the microbiological, we've talked a lot about this in this course. Uh, all the bacteria, the, the viruses, the, um, all the disease forming uh, micro, uh, microbes is, is, is a problem for the, for the health. Then there's some natural chemical ones. Uh, fluoride, arsenic, is, uh, fluoride is giving uh, limited movement because it, it, uh, it uh, kind of create more bone into the elbows, into the knees, and uh, it destroys the teeth. Arsenic is making you, um, can uh, give you cancer because it destroys the liver. So sometimes these, these things are, are found naturally in the water, not as a, as a pollution, but, but uh, not a human pollution, but naturally. Um, and that's a problem. And then we have some man-made things. If you have too much nitrate, heavy metal, pesticides, uh, even chlorine that is used for treating the water. Um, some things, uh, our pollution can also create problems for the drinking water. But we also have some uh, water quality problems that are not directly, that are not disease forming, but uh, they, we call them organoleptic. That means the taste, the odor, the appearance looks uh, bad, it tastes bad. Uh, and there may be some, some uh, taste from the hardness, from the salinity, if there's too much salt in it. Iron, manganese can give a, a, a bad taste. So it means that you won't drink this water. You don't like it because it looks bad, it, it tastes bad. Uh, iron containing water is, is, is uh, very ugly also. So, but the problem is as big as this one. Because if you don't want to drink this, then you go back to the other one the other source that may be contaminated with, with microbiological things. So, so it is, even though it sounds like organoleptic is not such a big problem, it's just a taste, but it means that people are not drinking it. And then there is some uh, technical problems here with uh, some aggressive uh, carbon dioxide. The pH, the alkalinity may be, may be problematic, hardness, iron. Some things that uh, may uh, clog your, your pipes with time. Uh, we all know about hardness. We have to clean our taps once in a while here in Denmark, for example. We have a lot of hardness in the, in the water. So there's some technical problems with these. If we look at the where, where do we find these problems? If we look at springs, sometimes we have fluoride in the springs, uh, but that is the biggest problem uh, normally we see there. In the groundwater, we sometimes find fluoride, we sometimes find iron, arsenic, manganese, dissolved solids, uh, salinity, uh, that is the same. Uh, calcium we can find in some groundwater. In surface water, the problem is completely different. That is bacteria, <coughs> is suspended solids, uh, particles, nitrate, uh, BOD is organic matter. And then the brain is typically not so much of a problem. But the alkalinity uh, may be a problem, as we said, it's a problem with the soap. Um, BOD may be a problem if, it's, if the roof is dirty. You can also get some uh, organic things into that. 
So it's quite different uh, problems you find, especially between surface water and groundwater. And they have to be treated in different ways. So, when are we going to treat, just to start, just to frame this whole thing, um, it's not always to treat it. And, if, and, and there are some reasons that you don't do it as the first thing here. Uh, you should start looking for a feasible source. If there's another source that you don't need to treat, you would go for that, investigate that first. Treatment is usually difficult to maintain. You have to, somebody has to treat it and you have to control that it's treated well. And it, 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 it is difficult to do. Sometimes it also costs money. Uh, some can be very cheap, so it's not a big problem, but it, it costs some money. Every day, every month, you have to pay something. And it requires motivation and training uh, for the people who have to do it, if they're in the household, um, and, or if it's a common system where someone is employed to, to, to treat it. It's not everything we can treat. For example, salinity is not on the list here. Those, those things we can treat is bacteria, silt, uh, particles, iron, manganese, chloride, and arsenic. These are the things that we can treat. But salinity, we can also treat, but not in practice. I mean, salinity is something you can treat with a, uh, with a, with a big um, reverse osmosis uh, machine, but it's something that you don't install in a village because it's expensive and it requires very high skilled labor. So these are the ones we can look at. I'll show you a lot of uh, treatment technologies now, and uh, I'll present it this way, that there is something called pre-treatment and there's something called post-treatment or <coughs> disinfection. In the cases of the bacteria, at least we call it disinfection. Pre-treatment is usually to remove the, the particles. First you remove the particles, then you remove the bacteria, because the bacteria can hide inside the particles and uh, therefore, it's better to get the particles. They're usually easier, easier to remove. But the disinfecting agents, they're usually not as, as effective on the bacteria when they're hiding inside the, the particle. Then I'm also going to show you whether some examples of how to apply it on a household scale and how to apply it on a community scale. And that is uh, most... Uh, methods can be used uh, both places, but of course they look different in, in size and, and so on. The first one is uh, hardly a treatment technology, but there is a way that when you have a river that is uh, contaminated upstream from human settlements, there is a simple way that you can actually take the water. If you make a small well nearby the river, then you can drive the water through the soil here and, and pump it up here. And the general guidelines is, uh, is, is if you, you have to place this well about, this is feet, 10 to 100 feet, 3 to 30 meters away, depending on the size of the river. So you can actually get some pretty clean water from uh, just pumping it there, because then you have the treatment, the filtration through the soil here. And the water will continuously come running from... from uh, on this river, so you can have a uh, river uh, water all the time. It's uh, it's pretty simple and uh, not expensive. So, is it also what if the river is dried out that the water is uh, unable to drink in its sense? Well, sometimes you may like, like if the river, I mean, dries out with time. So you could say the water level would, yeah, in practice, fall to to below here. Uh, you can see from the drawing here, for some time you would be able to, to, to take water also there until it totally dries up. It depends a bit on what, what does it actually look like here. But maybe for some a bit more time you can, you can study this one. You could also make a well, I mean an open, open dock well here, that would actually uh, benefit from the river water. Then there's uh, sedimentation. If you have particles in your water, there's the very old uh, household method where you have, for example, three pots here. You take your dirty water, put it in the first bucket, you leave it there for one day, uh, let it settle, then you pour it into the second bottle, there, then you have a, a, a 
some less dirty water because a lot of it has sedimented and then you after two days you pour it into the third one where you have the, the clean water here that, that's the system it doesn't give you uh, it's a pre-treatment so it's removing particles but definitely not enough uh, bacteria in the in the community system you can have a flow where, where the water is running into a sediment tank here all the sediments would fall down here and the clean water would come here um, not not so usable this is not so uh, much used in uh, alone in a, in a village but uh, this is from a from a bigger plant what it, what it looks like in practice here something that can be used in the villages is, is something that for example red cross is uh, promoting a lot uh, silver impregnated ceramic filters where you have a bucket this is a bucket and then you have inside a small uh, um, ceramic filter here, which, which has very small holes. And if you put some kind of silver layer on, on top of it, I think it's very little silver, it's not very expensive. Uh, then that gives some uh, catalytic uh, uh, killing of the bacteria also. So you can get the drinking water clean here. And on a, on a photo, it looks like this. Um, here's the the pocket, and if you look down into it, you can yeah, you can see the ceramic filter. Here. Yes. I think I need to wash it sometimes uh, from uh, inside. To treat the surface, I mean, there would be some, some, the particles would form a layer inside. So sometimes you need to wash it uh, inside. I suppose it might clog. Also, you, it would gradually close the small, small pores. I mean, this is thousands, millions of small pores, small holes. It may clog, but uh, I think it's made in a way that that is not so, so typical. It's going to break before that. Uh, sometimes they fall on the floor, and then uh, that, that happens often. Multi-use. Uh, I mean, you you use this for as long as you can, years. If you can, if you don't break it, you can use it for for years. Um, I would say with most of these treatment methods, I may not be able to mention it every time, you treat only water for drinking or cooking, drinking and, and cooking. Um, because it's water runs slowly through this, a very small hole, so it runs very small, slowly, so you produce small amounts, and uh, usually you don't produce for washing yourself or washing utensils. You only produce the water you need for drinking and cooking. What about washing hands? Not necessary. You can wash hands in dirty water. You can wash hands in dirty water. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, Without soap. No, you should oh, use okay. soap. <laughs> soap is important, but uh, uh, washing hands with dirty water, even with bacteria. I mean, the few you can you can survive with a few bacteria. The few that would be left after you clean your water is much better than the million that you have on your little uh, the little piece that you got from. Uh, Anus or uh, from someone you shake hands with. So, uh, no, it doesn't matter if it's water for, for the hands. Then, uh, the use of chlorine. Chlorine is something that uh, you, it, it's been used for tre treating water. It kills bacteria. It is not chloride, but it's chloride in an oxidized form. And it kills bacteria very effectively. And the one, uh, one way to apply it is to have such a pot here where you have a mixture of sand and ble of bleaching powder, which is uh, some uh, chlorine in some form, uh, some solid form, and then a bit of uh, sand, gravel here around it, and then you put it into, into a water body. And then it will slowly, uh, through these small holes down here, it will slowly... Uh, uh, run out, diffuse out of the of, of the pot and the, into the water, so it will always so it will keep a, a steady level here, and that can be applied in different ways. You can apply it to a to a pond like this, put it in a corner or maybe four corners of the pond here, 
or you can put it into a, an open well. In this case, it's made out of a simple plastic uh, waste uh, thing here. But the same thing, you have the powder that is slowly uh, running out of there. Then you can boil the water, as we know. It kills bacteria by boiling. It's often, uh, you know, requires a lot of uh, energy that is not always available, but but um, some places that is a good way to do it. Then you can use solar uh, for killing. Also, the UV radiation from the from the sun is killing bacteria uh, together with heat. If you paint it black, I mean, this is the 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 effective way to do it. You paint it black on one side, that means the water will be more warm. So the combination of hot water and UV radiation is very effective to treat water. And um, to make it even more effective, you, you can let it sediment first. So re again, removing the particles, half of the bacteria will also be removed, but that doesn't make any, any good to remove only half. But you remove the particles so it will be more effective, the sun can get easier to through, and the bacteria cannot hide in the, in the particles here. So in the, in the household, it looks like this. You need a bottles. You, you, here in this case, you just use uh, bottles with, which, which are not painted. It's still quite effective. Um, as you see, you need to manage a lot of bottles. It's not so easy if you, if you again, or we say five liters per person, so it's 25 liters. It's a lot of bottles you need to manage, and you need two sets because first you put it on the here she puts it on the on this rack here for for one day from morning to evening, and then it's clean. It's it's a one day treatment here. There's also some community size treatment plants here. They're not very common, but the other one is more common. Horizontal rough infiltration, this is some stones in different sizes, five centimeters, two centimeters, one centimeter maybe. So the water is running through this. It's actually a sedimentation. It's not really filtration as such because it's we're talking about stones. So it's not really removing bacteria. But, but on every stone, there's a small sedimentation. It's like a small sedimentation basin if you look at the, the uh, physics of it. So, so it's very effective. Instead of just letting it sediment to the bottom, then the, the particles are sedimenting on the stones, and that means it's very, very effectively in, in removing uh, bacteria. This is only for, for, um, for the community, and uh, it, it looks like this. Again, it's just pre-treatment. It's not uh, has to be followed by some disinfection here. Then there's the slow sand filtration. Um, we have it both the household. Slow sand filtration is filtrating through very fine sand. It's a sand of uh, about between 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 millimeter. Uh, it's very uh, fine sand, so it is draining the, the, the bacteria away. And on the top of the sand, you see the sand, the water is running down. See, it's running down through the sand here, and then it's collected in this tube here. Uh, on the top is a layer of biofilm on the top of the sand, which is very effective in killing. It's actually other bacteria that is that is killing the, the pathogenic uh, bacteria here. So that most of the treatment is happening in the top. Same here for our community size. It's, it's pretty expensive and, and difficult. Not difficult, but, but somehow advanced to, to manage. Again, you have sand, you have some stones down in the bottom here. Um, but these small filters is, is, is promoted quite many places. Yeah? Is the sand that you use, do you clean it in any way before you put it in? You wash it with water. Typically, I think you may also, if you should treat it, you put use some acidic treatment to remove uh, organic matter or dissolve stuff. Um, but normally I think you just wash it with water. They look like this, the ones that are you can find on the market, nice design. And uh, this is a this is a very small slow sand filter. Usually they are they are quite big. I think still London is using it. 
flow centrifugation. And this stops it recently. They, most of their water supply, yeah, some time ago, most of their water supply is based on that. Then if you have a pond with uh, dirty water, you can also filtrate it. Again, here is a, is a design where you, where you, you pump the water from the pond here. Uh, this, can, this pipe is connected to the pond. And then you pump it from up here until the sand uh, it goes through the sand and some stones, and then you get your clean water out here, and you can uh, where you can get it from a tap. Yeah. Uh, can you go yeah. Is there any point in letting the bowl water run through the clean water, like the design here that the pipe is going like through the clean water? You mean through that? Chamber here? Uh, no, if you see the, the vertical pipe yeah. that goes with the ball water, why does it go through? I think it's just behind. Let's uh, see if we can see it on this. I think in this case it's 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 not going through anything. It's probably just uh, cement. It doesn't look like this is part of the treatment plan. Let's take that to the end. Yeah. I I'm not sure what this drawing. Oh yeah, it is like this is the treated water because we can see it's running over here. No, I think it should just be in front. It should not be inside the water. It should just be in front, in front of the chamber here. So that's what it looks like here. You can see the pipe is out here, and they're pumping it up and goes through the sand, and then they're digging it up over there. It's a little bit expensive to to build, so. Uh, it's, uh, in 2009, we worked a bit in our project in, in West Bengal with a, with a more simple version of the palm sand filter here. Mm -hmm. And some students from DTU had designed this and implemented together with local organization here. Uh, we put it inside the water. The water is here. And then the palm sand filter is under the water. So we're using the sand here. Um, to, to filtrate it, water can come in both from this, this side and from this side here. And then um, we, we pick it up the water maybe from the bottom here and uh, pump it up here. And here is the clean water. So there's not, it's a very simple construction. Here you can see at a time where the water level is very low in the pond, uh, you can see how it's constructed um, with, with uh, bricks. <coughs> And this is the pump here, and in the background you can see the, the filter inside the, the pond here. We just, uh, though, I don't know if anyone here was there in the, uh, last week, uh, Thursday, uh, Mia Uenslayer was defending her bachelor thesis, and um, she has investigated this filter five years after, and still, the number of fecal polyforms is, is less than 10, even even though they have not maintained it. I think the sand is probably a little bit bigger size than it should be, but it has still, after five years, without more or less without maintenance, it is still giving clean water. The only thing is that they have protected the, their wells, and nobody, again, is going into the well again. But that seems to be a very simple and, and cheap option. Then... You may also find a lot of the different uh, new membrane technologies. You, uh, membranes is something that is being researched, and, and there are some different designs. I'm not, uh, I don't have a total overview of where we are. But the idea is that the water is going in through a small tube with very, very small holes. So it needs to come under some pressure to get out, and then it runs out through the, through the sides here, and, and it's clean and then the dirty water will continue to the to the other side. So it, you, you're deconcentrating the the bacteria. Um, there are some different designs. A very well known one um, is invest is invented by a Danish based Swiss company, I think. Is the life straw. You probably saw that where you can actually suck the water up from very, very dirty water. And inside, there's a lot of technology inside, but the main thing is the membrane filter, but there's also some chemicals and, and uh, uh, 
I don't think they have told exactly what it does. And also some um, silver things killing the bacteria. So it's a little bit a uh, water treatment plant inside such a straw. That is also made for a family version here where you have the water up, up here and it's running through a, a filter with membranes. In the very advanced case where you have a more motorized pump, you can pump it through um, for a community through, uh, through some bigger uh, reverse osmosis uh, plant, but this is probably too <coughs> advanced. It's not very much used, but the, the, the guys making this uh, straw, this uh, live straw, they're running a, a project in Uganda where they're supplying quite a quite a large area with the water from this one. Moving to iron removal, you can see I changed the word now. It was disinfection before, now I call it purification. And iron has to be removed in a way that you first oxidize the water, then the iron will be oxidized to from 2, iron 2 to iron 3, and then it will combine with the air, with the oxygen, and it will precipitate. So that is kind of the pre-treatment. Here, up here, in this, just by running through these uh, small pebbles here, it will oxidize and, and, and then you can filter. It will sediment in the bottom here, and then it will filter through stones. These, these are small stones. And then you get uh, clean water here. So that is a simple iron removal plan if you have that problem. Arsenic, some of you have arsenic in your, in your village. There are different ways to treat that. Both arsenic and fluoride. Yeah, some of you have fluoride also, yeah? Uh, for some reason, uh, because fluoride and arsenic are very different chemicals, actually. But for some reason, they share the same uh, treatment methods, actually. Yeah. You can use uh, coagulation, flocculation. Uh, you add some coagulants. It could be um, uh, potassium... Uh, but, uh, aluminium sulfate, uh, which will, uh, where the aluminium will um, form aluminium hydroxide, and it, it will form some flops, like like small, uh, uh, yeah, some kind of precipitate, and 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 that precipitate will grab the the arsenic or grab the fluoride, and then it will precipitate to to the bottom here. That is the principle in the both in the household version and and in the village plant here. You can see here you add the coagulant, you may add, need to add some, some base also to, to change the pH, but uh, in some cases you do the same in here, you do this um, this is the one we made, some students made it uh, in, in uh, West Bengal here for arsenic um, they mix it in this container and then they filter it either through some uh, sand in a plastic bag bucket or sand in a in a in a clay pot here. This is a fluoride method where they are pouring it in, stirring it and then sedimenting and you get the clean water. And this is a big uh, plant here. So this is one of the measures uh, flocculation. Another method is the adsorption. You can have some different uh, materials. For example for fluoride we use uh, bone char. This is a uh, animal bones which have been charred at very high temperatures so you get uh, kind of a uh, ashes kind of product um, which which is uh, very good at absorbing the, the fluoride otherwise you can use aluminium oxide which is also a product that is pretty uh, cheap so you just fill it into a, a column here and then you run the water in and um, then it will be adsorbed here. So with time, the, 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 it will get uh, saturated. So with time, it will no, no longer adsorb anymore. Um, but, but for some time, it will work here. In the case of um, arsenic in, in, um, in West Bengal, it's often combined with, the, with iron. So first, we have to remove the iron before, otherwise the iron will quickly coat all the... This is the adsorbent here. Uh, aluminium oxide in this case. Uh, so first we have a sand filter. This is for a household uh, solution here, where there's a sand filter in one, then it runs into the to the aluminium oxide, and it, then it runs out here. So in uh, 
in the household version, it looks like this, one for sand, one for um, aluminum oxide, and in the community version, it uh, looks like, like this. Again, sand is here, aluminum oxide is here. So uh, this is all, both these designs are developed by, by a student from DCU in our courses in West Bengal. This is another DTU student, Jane, who went to um, uh, Thailand together with uh, Augusto, who's sitting here, looking at fluoride in, uh, some time ago. And this is a fluoride filter with bone char, uh, animal bones, that are supplying water for a temple in uh, Thailand. Right, we're coming to the end here. Um, This is kind of, you could say, a summary for the whole water supply <coughs> thing here. And first, the importance is to get water closer to people. Again, it's the thing. More important to have more water than to have cleaner water. First of all, you need to, more water to, to, to clean your hands and so on. So you get people water closer to people, you look at more water, so you have enough. You need at least say 20, 25 liters, then you have enough for washing hands. If you have 20, 25 liters per person per day. And then in the end you keep it, look at cleaner water. All of this you should look at, but, but in this priority here. Uh, should choose the most appropriate water supply system. Again, as I said before, look at the sources you have available. Try to find the best source, the cleanest, the easiest, and um, find the best water supply system, and then treat the water only when necessary, because it, it takes some effort to, to treat it, and it is maybe, uh, can be difficult to maintain. And then look at the textbook. You can also, as I said, look at the slides here. There is some <coughs> formulas that I, 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 I hit uh, when showing this, but the formulas are somewhere in between and then the textbook for design here.